What's up, guys? Today's podcast is with Jason Rao. He was super awesome to talk to. He's an OG in this industry. Uh, not a lot of people know about him, but both the Ryan brothers have stated that he's probably one of the best in the gym. He is looking forward to competing this year at trials and hopefully taking it at 88. We talk about that. Um, he's a really interesting guy, and how he thinks about stuff is kind of similar to how I think about jiu-jitsu, so it was super cool to talk to him and kind of dive into that. I have two ads in this podcast. Uh, this is something new that I'm doing. I did get ads now. I'll timestamp those so you can totally skip through them if you want. If you like the products, I use them and uh, I think they work. So feel free to go buy some. It does help the podcast. All right, enjoy. My name is Jason Rao. I've been training for about 13 years. I got my black belt in 2016 under Matt Sarah. Um, just, you know, I own a gym. This is, you know, a way of life for me. It's, you know, my career, my passion, my hobby, you know, it's, it's, you know, a huge part of my life. I'm very happy to be able to, you know, do it full time and make a living doing it. Sweet. Yeah. And so you, you've had both the Ryan brothers kind of talk about you and both of them have pretty much said you're like one of the greatest guys that they've ever rolled with and and he, even Gordon has said admittedly that you're probably one of his hardest roles what how, how do you get to that like there's not many people that can say that even Gordon's having hard times with uh I mean I would say you know like I was kind of in that environment with them you know at the blue basement um you know so I had exposure you know kind of like they did to like uh, like a really high level training environment you know kind of before, obviously before the split of the DDS and, you know, when they were kind of coming up, not that I was like the first one there, but I was definitely in part of that, like earlier group of guys. And that just gave me access to, you know, super high level training partners, like super high level instruction. And, you know, definitely being in that environment was a huge part of shaping like my grappling into what it is today, you know? And I think like everyone that was there for that, um, kind of would would share share those feelings and share that experience of like being in that room and and you're not just the tough training partners because i think there's a lot of room for tough training partners but just the environment of when like kind of um i would say like grappling really started to change around that time and it kind of shaped into what it is today that was like kind of a special time i feel and it was cool to like be there for that and kind of see that progress into what it is today yeah, well, what was that kind of like? I mean, we know that like how Gordon and John teach now because of the instructionals, but being there in those early stages, was it just kind of like almost you were in a science lab in a way? Yeah, that's kind of what it felt like a little bit. You know, it was like originally it was, it was you know, before Danaher had, had any like competitive grappling scenes, it was, it was, you know, John Danaher, then really Eddie Cummings was the first guy to kind of have success, him and Gary. And then Gordon was like a little bit behind those guys, at least initially, because he had started a little later. But when I first started going there, it was like them three together and John. And then it was like, you know, everyone else that kind of came through that room, like, you know, Ethan Krellison, Oliver Taza, obviously Nicky Ryan, like or even before Craig had like any, like, you know, intermingling with those guys, like, you know, those were kind of like the core guys. I mean, Jake Shields was there. Uh, you know, I'm definitely forgetting some people, John Callistein, you know, Frank Rosenthal. There's like kind of a whole group of guys that like have went, you know, gone off and, you know, are kind of doing their own thing now or whatever. But, you know, it was like definitely like, uh, it was like this new, because I was already a black belt when I started going there. So it was like this new type of jujitsu, like specifically the leg locks, but, but really a, a lot of positions, things I'd never seen before and that nobody else was doing. And it was kind of like almost being like crafted by like John, you know, da definitely down her leading the way, but like those like group of like senior students kind of like collaborate together to like kind of create this new way of doing jujitsu. And it definitely being in that room for myself, it, it definitely gave me a mentality where I feel as if I can problem solve jujitsu in a way where like now I, mean, I don't train with these guys anymore. I have my own gym. You know, I'm, you know, the head instructor at my gym with my partner Nick Ronan and. You know, I feel like from being there, I kind of adapt to this like problem solving mindset where I feel like I can come up with 
techniques and positions kind of using the the methodology that I learned by training there. Does that make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. And it's a really good insight. And on that, uh, how different was it? You were, said you were already a black belt when you went in learning from John versus how you learned previously. Um, so my, my instructor, Matt Sarah, that was yeah. like who I came up under, uh, like he was very close with John. So when, mm -hmm. when John first started training, uh, you know, at Henzo's, you know, way back when I, I know Matt was his first instructor. So they had like a pretty good relationship. And it's interesting. Like a lot of the stuff that I learned, obviously like Matt was never like a big leg lock guy. So a lot of that stuff like was new to me, but like a lot of simple stuff that John would show that like a lot of people had never seen before. I had seen from like learning from Matt, like a lot of like, uh, like if you look at like, um, especially Gordon's like whole half guard system, yeah. like, like a lot of that is, I think stem from John that like, not, not that Matt taught it to John, but there's a lot of similarities like that I would see that I learned when I was like a white and blue belt, like training under Matt, which I thought was kind of cool to see that influence because I could definitely see it. But specifically, um, obviously the leg locks, the way they were attacked back, like the, the way John broke everything down into like systems, like, you know, not, not just like positional systems, but submission systems definitely was um, different to what I was used to and I think what most people were used to. And it, it was definitely a very eye-opening experience training there. It was the type of thing where I would go in and take a class and I'm sure most students have experience similar to this where they, you know, they train at their gym, like one class, they really absorb, it really goes very, very well for them. And then another class, maybe the techniques didn't fit for them or didn't work for them. But I felt like every session there, like the techniques were immediately actionable. Like I could implement them right away they were like immediately useful and they kind of are like wow this is like i've never seen this before this is really good and it kind of just like it, it really fit into i think myself and a lot of people's games very very well do you think that comes from just that like method that they have of knowing how to teach and understanding how to like john was a, in college teaching and or do you think that there's something else I think that's definitely part of it. I think he has a you know, very academic approach, uh, given his background. I think that definitely is part of it. I think also um, he's like a really one of the few people in jujitsu who's a full time coach, so having not competed himself, especially like being at the point where he doesn't really train very much. He kind of gets to sit back and like take that like third person point of view, and I, I think he is very actively focusing on the coaching role and ways he can not necessarily just like improve his students, but also push the sport to a different level, which I think he certainly has done. Uh, so I think his academic background is a big part of it. And, you know, kind of taking those concepts of the way, like, you know, in universities, the way, you know, knowledge is, is like absorbed or, you know, passed on to students and like, like putting that into jujitsu, but also I think his role as a, strictly a coach was pretty pivotal as well in being able to um you know come up with these new ideas and techniques and systems and then pass it on to students also he's, he's a smart guy as well you know I think yeah it's a combination of those things and okay like sm smart in the sense like i i think there's some people who are very smart but maybe not jujitsu smart like i think it takes a certain type of um brain or skill i guess to be able to like visualize jiu-jitsu and and you know come up with things and be good at jiu-jitsu i think it's it's more than just being smart it's like a certain type of intelligence and he, he has that intelligence for sure okay and is that kind of the the approach you're taking and you're gonna kind of focus more in on being that full-time coach uh i mean i still train every you know, every day with my students uh, i'm supposed to be competing in the adcc ottawa open two and a half weeks so okay. i mean definitely i mean i'm not like old i'm 33 you know but definitely with the gym like taking more of a, a coaching role but the biggest thing for me is just the ability to uh problem solve in my training like if, if i have an issue with something i think a lot of students especially when you first start out like you don't know anything like you of course in, of course like looking to that higher belt or your instructor for answers to questions and stuff like that but i think at a certain point you can kind of develop this mentality that you could kind of solve these things yourself. And, and I think it's very much in a, in a healthy training environment. It's like very much a collaborative effort. Uh, and that's what I 
especially being at, in the blue basement, that's what I noticed a lot. It was, it was not that like, obviously John was kind of was at the top, but you know, there would be a specific problem that, you know, since a lot of us you know, were learning the same things. We would do the same movements and we would encounter the same problems and there'd be a specific problem we were encountering. It would be like the team would work on it together and try to solve those problems. Like, you know, someone would come up with something, people would try it out, tweak it, and kind of like it was a collaborative effort to come up with new movements or solutions to the problems you're encountering while, while grappling. Obviously, John was kind of at the head of that, but he was not opposed to somebody, you know, uh, you know, coming up with an answer to a problem and then the rest of the team kind of adopting that answer as long as that, that particular answer was a good solution to the problem. So, like, that's kind of the training environment I want to cultivate, like, where – Obviously, like I'm available to my students to help them and guide them, but like it's not uncommon for a student to come up with like, "Hey, Jason, I started playing with this uh, to, to deal with this particular issue," and I take that and tweak it and show it to other people. And so it's kind of a, I think that's the best environment where it's a collaborative effort where like the team is working together to troubleshoot these different positions and problems based on what they're encountering in training competition. Okay, and that, I mean, that's pretty cool. And and where do you see like a lower belt's input? Like, does it matter to you the belt level if if the move uh, makes sense? Not, not, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, so like I would say the lower belt has to understand like the position enough to understand you know what the problem is. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like for example, like in a cross ashi position or a saddle position, like extremely common problem is the turnout problem where the person hides their foot and, and spins out. Like as long as the person understands that's the, the problem you're going to be running into and understands the position. And, and there are many times the student will say, hey, Jason, have you ever done this? And I'll say, yes, I have. Like, I don't find that works for this or that reason. Or I do find that works in this situation, but you can play with it yourself and kind of, you know, and, and kind of see if it works for you. But, you know, like, so I would say most of my students are pretty consistent, even like the, the blue belts have a pretty good understanding of like the modern jujitsu game and like the common themes and issues in most of the positions that they're going to encounter. So I'm definitely not you know opposed to a student like coming up with a pro like a solution and coming to me and, and saying, hey, I think this works. This has worked well in this situation. And then myself taking it and trying to tweak it or try it myself and see if I, I think it's a good, good option. Okay. And yeah, in, in terms of the modern jujitsu game, we kind of are seeing like the, the leg locks happened and now we're getting more into the like heavy pressure top game. Do you think there's any unexplored territories when it comes to jujitsu that we haven't really f figured out yet? Um, I think, I think you're just going to continue to see more interplay between all these positions. So obviously, I mean, the ADCC rule set, ADCC seems to be the dominant you know, no gi format right now. Uh, the ADCC rule set favors heavy um, stand up, you know, heavy wrestling. So I think you're going to continue to see that interplay between, between like the jiu jitsu, the submissions, the wrestling, and like the up down positioning where you're going from bottom to standing to top. And I, I think you're going to, like, the game is going to continue to evolve in that direction. And I think you're no longer going to be able to get away with not practicing those different facets. Like, like you're going to need to have at least good leg lock defense, good understanding of the leg lock. Game. You're going to need to have good wrestling, good counter wrestling. You're going to need to have some type of passing. Like you're not going to only be able to be a guard player or a top player, or, you know, or a specialist up full. And I think guys are going to continue to just get better at all these facets of the game. And you're going to see a lot more, complete grapplers which i think we are seeing i think that adcc this year was pretty pretty evident and if you compare it to the last adcc and then the one before that i think you're seeing uh just an increase in the skill level each year uh pretty significantly okay and would you say for people that are looking to kind of make it into that professional scene to start focusing heavily on just adcc rule set set um not necessarily um I mean, I, I would focus, I, I guess it depends on how far along that individual is. I would focus on, on being a, an effective grappler overall, which would encompass like multiple things, which would encompass um, being proficient in your guard, being proficient on top, passing the guard, being
being proficient finishing from dominant positions and being proficient in wrestling and you know taking the person down defending takedowns um i think you know though especially more so heavy in the wrestling is very important for adcc but if you're doing ibjjf that stuff is important as well probably le- like the wrestling is less important than ibjjf but it's still important I mean, if you're doing an ebi rules tournament which by no means are, are dead but I, I definitely think the sport is moving away from that in those rule sets like the you know wrestling doesn't really matter very much you know you're more focused on the submissions and the submission defense but i mean i think Competing in multiple rule sets is gonna is 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 a valuable thing just because it's gonna you know force you to work on different skills that one rule set may may or may not force you to work on. So I do think the sport is moving in that ADCC direction. I mean, if you want to, if your sole goal is to win ADCC, you know, perhaps maybe focus specifically on that rules. But I think I think one should look to become a complete grappler where you could can you know potentially compete in any rule set in, you know, in a couple of weeks notice and not feel like you have to change your entire game to, to do so. Do you think there's a more efficient way of kind of structuring our, our jiu-jitsu training as a whole to create better grapplers, like creating actual curriculum and stuff? Uh, or? Yeah. I mean, so at my gym, like we, so we, I mean, like most gyms, we have like different, you know, programs. I have like a fundamentals fest, which is designed for, you know, for, for, for new people to the sport. And truthfully, like a lot of people that do jiu-jitsu are hobbyists. And so I think designing a jiu-jitsu program with, uh, with solely improving your skills as quickly as possible is not necessarily good business. So like, for example, in my, we have like a new session every day at my gym, you know, it's a quote unquote, the advanced class. Like I have a set curriculum that I do. We focus on the same position for a set amount of time. And it's really structured towards competing. But at the same time, in my fundamentals classes, we don't do that. Like we, we have a curriculum, but it's structured towards teaching, you know, introducing people to jiu-jitsu in a safe and like fun way where they're going to, you know, enjoy it and not get hurt. Like a lot of them are in their forties, have nine to five jobs, have kids, you know? So I think like, I think jujitsu, the jujitsu industry as a whole is, is like an industry of mostly like quote unquote hobbyists. So yeah, I definitely think academies could structure their training better for the like professional athlete, but like most of the people that are keeping a jiu-jitsu academy open are hobbyists and probably wouldn't enjoy or benefit from that type of training. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. What what do you think it would take for jiu-jitsu to kind of take that next step into the professional sports world? Um, I think definitely having a unified tool set. I think that's the first first thing they need to do. I mean, that could be ADCC. I, I do think ADCC is is on the more spectator friendly side. Um, I do think uh, I do think there could be other variations as well that could be good too. Um, but it seems like ADCC is the way to go at this point, just because you know it's it's the biggest uh, you know biggest event of the sport. Like the last one was a massive success. They just got signed to UFC Fight Pass. Like I see that as being the dominant rule set. But I think like, you know, just just having one rule set across the board, I think would be is the first step. And I think the way things are going with ATC, specific, specifically with Mo Jassim, I think it's moving towards that mainstream type event. I mean, like, it, for example, uh, like who's number one? Like I, I enjoy watching who's number one, but I don't think it's very spectator friendly to someone who doesn't already enjoy our sport or doesn't already do jiu-jitsu like most of the people who watch jiu-jitsu like kind of train jiu-jitsu but i i think this year at agc there's you know, fourteen thousand people there i think that garnish some fans that might not do jiu-jitsu or you know and i think someone like gordon you know say what you will about his like internet personality he definitely brings people into the sport who don't actually do this sport and that's like the key element of, of gaining fans like you know, if you look at the NBA or the NHL or NFL, whatever, MLB, any of those major sports, like most of the fans don't play the sport. But in jiu-jitsu, all the fans pretty much play the sport. So I think I think what ADCC is doing is correct. But like going back to who's number one, like I don't think it's very spectator friendly. Although I, as a, as a grappler, I enjoy watching probably more than ADCC. But I, I think that is not the right rule set. I think 
you have to move towards one rule set, probably ADCC. And, uh, and yeah, I think that would result in, in more spectators. It would push the sport further uh, from, from a financial perspective and it would make it easier for people to understand and follow. If you have one rule set that everyone can, can understand. Are you looking to get some new gear for your rolling and lifestyle needs? Submission Fighting Co. has you covered both out and inside the gym. The quality is amazing and I love the little detail like these patches on the rash guard and don't forget about the elastic on both the shorts and shirts. They keep it modern with designs made by Ed May right out of my old home, the Bay Area. Our community's small so let's always try and support each other. Use code GWG to get 10% off your next order at submissionfightingco.com. kind of get under yeah do you think that adcc and its rise and, and gordon's rise and kind of the controversy around these top level guys and and steroids will be something that that hinders the sport in the long run um it definitely could i mean so i think i think the question is like like for example in the ufc like usada like you know i'm not saying no one in ufc does steroids but you know, there's a, a go, USADA is the governing body that, that takes care of that. I mean, that is, you know, that's the athletic commission that's taking care of that. Like, you, you know, so like USADA and the athletic commission work together and then the UFC is its own separate entity. Like the UFC is not, you know, is, you know, USADA is not under the UFC. USADA is like a, a like an anti-doping agency. So if, if, uh, BJJ or grappling got to the point where like the athletic commission was involved, then it would certainly be an issue. I think, you know, and I, I mean, I, I don't know if that's ever going to be an issue. I, I have no idea, but I, I know in New York, uh, there's some, like, there's been some issues with some local events where the, I mean, nothing with steroid testing, but um, the athletic commission is, is forcing some jujitsu events to do blood tests for the competitors. If they're selling tickets or some weird like loophole, but um, so, I mean, if they do get involved, then, then that would definitely happen. But, uh, I don't know if they, if the athletic commission never got involved, I mean, I think steroids are definitely an issue in jiu-jitsu. I don't want to say the issues are definitely, uh, widely used in jujitsu. Um, I think maybe to a certain point, it would decrease the legitimacy of the sport if, if, if they're not like corralled in and taken under control to a certain point, but I mean, I think there's a, I think there's some professional sports where steroids are rampant and they're still popular. Yeah. You know, that... maybe, maybe. I mean, for a while, like, I know in, in Major League Baseball now it's not like that, but there was a period of time when it was like that. I think, yeah, you know, I don't know the numbers, but I feel like it was so popular when, yeah. when, when that was happening. But again, who knows? But I do think if, if the athletic commission gets involved, then the sports could have no choice but the but force to, like, people monitor. And, and test the athletes okay yeah i mean that makes sense where uh where do you kind of want to see the sport professionally be in like the next five years um i would like to see it uh you know definitely move, like move in the direction that it's going right now i mean i think i think uh i think somewhere in terms of like i think the sport is somewhere along the same line where the UFC was like 15 or 15 years ago, you know, like, um, like when like the UFC had those first like major stars, like Chuck Liddell, I think that's like comparable to like how Gordon Ryan is, is right now. And, um, I would, I would definitely like to see a unified rule set. I think that would, you know, increase the, the financial, um, the, the, well, the financial incentives of the athletes competing, I think they would get paid more money if there was, you know, one unified rule set. Um, and I would, I would like to see the, 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 you know, grappling similar kind of to how the UFC. It's not now, but like, you know, similar type of trajectory where they're like building stars, uh, you know, they're building people's brands and building stars. Like, because right now, I just feel like it's, it's just like war. For the mm -hmm. most part, you know, there's obviously yeah. other people who are popular within the sport. But there's no one that's popular outside of the sport. So I think uh, if there was some type of governing body for grappling, and through that they were able to build up different athletes and like kind of build stars within the sport, I think I think that would push the 
the sport to the next level and have it like along the trajectory that the UFC went along. Okay. Yeah. And, and I mean, you kind of watched Gordon come up and like, so as a, as a new guy in jujitsu, what advice would you have to kind of get to that level of exposure? I mean, people knew Gordon before he was who he is now. Yeah. I mean, so I think for him, it was definitely like a few different factors. I mean, he's, I don't want to say he's, he like definitely stirred the pot a lot. So, you know, especially, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago when like Brazilians were kind of the dominant uh, guys in the sport, he definitely stirred the pot a lot. So for a few reasons, I think because of his personality, but also he was kind of coming from this, like, you know, not to use the team name, like new wave of jujitsu of people doing leg locks and practicing this kind of new and different style style of jujitsu. And I think like a lot of the traditionalists were resistant to that, which I think is how, you know, anything like that goes in any sport or field where like someone is like, uh, you know, coming in and changing the ideals of, of that particular industry. Like, I think there's always going to be, they're always going to be met with, met with resistance. So I think, uh, for him, that was part of it. Also, he's, you know, somewhat of a controversial guy. Not that honestly, he likes to start arguments, but he's definitely like a, a bit of a personality on social media, which I think definitely helps him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, f- I mean, for somebody who's like aspiring to be like that, like I, f- I feel like for Gordon, like it works so well because he always wins. Like if if somebody was like he is and doesn't win, it's just not going to work. That's true. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, I mean, he kind of says it all the time, but like, I mean, focus on being the best you possibly can in jiu-jitsu. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would say like, that's the most important thing, uh, more so than like talking or anything like that. And, you know, and then if you want to push your brand, like if you have the skills to back it up, I think that is exciting and something people want to see. Okay. And you kind of have a, the opposite career path as as gordon like you're this this unicorn that i feel like people don't know about and they once they learn about you and get your instructionals and stuff they end up finding all the stuff out about you but like why are you not or why do you feel you're not the same level but when Uh, they're i mean i mean i certainly don't have the competition success that you have you know i mean that's you know number one um but i mean i'm definitely not very outspoken guy i'm pretty quiet and which I think Gordon actually in person is also. He's just, you know, very outspoken on social media. Um, I mean, he's certainly, again, he certainly has a lot more competition success that, that I have, like, that, that I've had. Um, you know, that's a, obviously a major part of it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a particularly outspoken guy. Like, I post only recently that I really started posting a lot on social media. Like, yeah. I started posting all these jiu-jitsu reels. Uh with the help of uh, one of my students, he like convinced me to do it. He does like all the editing for it, but um, yeah, I definitely think like I, I don't have that type of personality where I want to draw. Like even doing that for myself, it took me like <laughs> a little bit to get. I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna do this. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I'm happy I did it because like it definitely increased my brand awareness and it was good for my gym. Um, but like it's not in me to to do that to be out there yeah yeah at this point for me and my career like i definitely am still going to compete i'm doing the trials this year but for me the most important thing is building my gym and like building uh not just like a competition team but building like a team uh and culture within my gym and through that building like a a high level competition that's awesome that's kind of like my main focus right now Okay. And, and is there something you wish you knew when you started jujitsu that like knowing now would have you, made it a little bit easier for um, you? Um, wish I knew. Uh, I definitely think when I started, I, hmm, I, I definitely didn't like, so kind of going back to what I, uh, like said earlier, like I would, I felt like when I first started, I didn't, not that like, when you first start, you should be coming up with anything at all. But I would kind of, I was very good at like watching other people. Like I would watch the Mendes brothers a lot and like, just like copying what they did and anything that I was doing that like, wasn't shown to me by someone, like I thought was like wrong. But then as I got more and more experienced, like I feel like some of the, 
things I'm most successful with are like things that I kind of like, I like added my own touch to, or added my own like element to that I had learned from someone else. So maybe I learned to move from someone else and I maybe changed it to make it work for me. And those are the things that I feel like work best for me. So I kind of like trust myself more to, I remember like drilling stuff that I would learn online and then doing stuff in training. I'd be like, Oh, I shouldn't do that because like I didn't see that on AOJ.com or something like that, you know, but, but really like then like years later, I was like, wait, that was a good thing. I, I should have kept doing that, you know? Yeah. And I, not trusting yourself as much as you should. Yeah. It's, I know it's kind of hard too sometimes when your coaches aren't super supportive of like outside learning, but where, as you came up, did you find your like best resources were? Was it in the, tra- I mean, you were in one of the best training rooms, but <laughs> Was it in the training room or were you YouTubing matches or? So when I was like, so when I was, so I, I, I got, uh, I, I trained at Matt Sarah's like, and I still, I'm, up until open the gym, I still always train there. I taught for him for like years. Um, like uh, before going to Henzo's, I would, like I watched a lot of Matt's, uh, Matt Sarah's like old matches. Like I really liked his style of, of grappling. So that was a big, like, especially his guard passing was a big influence for me. But I watched the Memphis brothers a lot, Marcelo Garcia, like kind of what like a lot of people from that generation really enjoyed watching. I like watching Andre Galvao, but I would, I would like watch old matches or, or like watch, uh, there wasn't like BJ Fanatics or anything that they would have like, there was, uh, there was like AOJ, like the online website where they would post like these. I had a subscription to that and I would just like, drill all the things that they would post on there like i would watch it and then like bring my ipad to the gym like show up like an hour before class and just like drill all that stuff so that was like i learned all the bear bowl game from doing that um that was that was a big influence on me for sure but uh yeah then once i went to henzo's it was like all the people i wanted to grapple like were like already there so it was kind of like you know it wasn't like like coming up, it was like, all right, who do you want to like have your jiu- jujitsu look like? It was like, oh, I really like Marcelo Garcia. I like Matt Sarah. I like obviously Matt was someone that was there. But when I came up, he was like at the tail end of his career fighting, so he wasn't always like, you know, still like like he is now. He's in the gym teaching every day. It wasn't always like that. But but then it was like I went to Henzo. I was like, who do you want to grapple? Like? I was like, oh, I want to grapple like Eddie Cummings. He's like right over there. I want to <laughs> grapple like Gordon Ryan. Like so, it was it was kind of easy. You know, like the guys you wanted to be like are just right there. That's, so, <laughs> that's, that's it. Be like modeling yourself after somebody very, very easy. You know, okay. The information is all right there. Yeah. And do you think that there's a place for those instructionals and like outside resources? And what what, what weight does it take over like actually in live person learning? And, and where would you put it? Uh, uh, yeah, that's like, interesting. I think the accessibility of information is just so crazy right now that you could learn – like, I'm not saying you don't need an instructor. Like it definitely, I think I think the role of an instructor is these days. I don't want to say these days, but as opposed to you know maybe 15 years ago, or 10 years ago, the role of an instructor these days is definitely to guide you like along the path and like be there to like assist in your learning. Obviously, they if you're someone that's not looking at online resources, they may be your primary teacher. But I think there's plenty of people who you know, buy the Gordon Ryan DVDs or whatever, the John, any of these instructionals and attempt to learn from those. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think, I think, and I I don't think that should be a slight on your instructor, but I think your instructor should be there to help like guide you along with that. Because like, okay, watching the videos is definitely helpful, but there's a difference when, you know, Gordon Ryan locks up a head and arm control from half guard and when, you know, the three stripe white belt does it. And like your instructor could definitely help you like bridge that gap. Like, okay, Gordon showed this, but it's, it's like one thing to like know all these moves. Like I know the whole Gordon passing half guard system and then to be able to actually apply that and like have the right, like weight distribution and sensitivity and right positioning to actually do it correctly. Okay. You know, I definitely, on the contrary, I definitely, I have, it's funny cause I have a few, I have a few blue belts who like learned leg locks very, very early on. Like we're like four stripe white belts and like knew a lot about leg locks, but like didn't know anything else. And I jokingly like make fun of them. I'm like, you guys like know all these intricate leg sequences, but you can't get out of side control. Or, like, you can't pass half guard or anything, you know, stuff like that, which I think 
I think some people definitely kind of over educate themselves. Like they like, no, they're like, Gordon does this from here. And they know all these answers. But they can't do any of them. So I right. think there's definitely uh, uh, like there's going to be, I think there's like a happy medium where maybe you watch the instructor that'll help you along the way, but then having your in-person instructor, as long as, which I think they should be, as long as they're good with you doing that, which I think they should be good with that, like kind of melding those things together, I think is, is going to be very helpful. Okay. And do you think that there's a, like a path that you should take when you're picking up instructionals? Like, should I learn this first or as a beginner and starting? Um, I think, um, I would say generally speaking, like I think beginners should focus on like defense first. Like, so like pin escapes, like guard retention, like things like that, I would say are more, the beginner like focus topics because you probably spend more of your time in those positions if you're, especially if you're training with more advanced people when you start out um but yeah i think i know john has a pin escapes instructional i, I haven't personally watched it. i'm sure it's very good um things like pin escapes guard retention like i think half guard passing is really good for beginners just because most beginners don't have the like ability to keep someone off them and they end up in half guard pretty constantly. Um, and just like, I mean, if there's anything explaining like uh, your positioning and dominant positions, I think, I think that's really important as well. And then like, I think once you can hold position and you can pass the guard and you have an understanding of how to maintain your guard, I think the submissions will start to come a lot easier, you know, at that point, I, I don't feel like, like learning, for example, leg locks right away. I don't necessarily think that's a good pathway for someone who's brand. Okay. So just kind of staying more at the like basic fundamentals. Yeah, the traditional, like, I don't want to say traditional mm -hmm. basics, but like, for example, like in our fundamentals class at my gym, there's like a big emphasis on pin escapes, guard retention, guard passing, like how to maintain dominant position. Like not that we don't show any submissions, but like, there's not like a, a crazy emphasis on submissions. It's like under, I think understanding what all the positions are, especially as a, as a white belt, understanding what all the positions are um, and like understanding what your objectives are from those positions, I think is more important than any like individual movement in itself. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and do you think that this kind of new style of training that we're seeing where people are starting in positions is a lot more beneficial to that versus just drilling moves over and over again? Uh, what do you mean, like, like doing positional training? Or? Yeah, positional training versus just uh, drilling. Yeah, well, I think I think there has to be a, a combination of both. So I think, so I think when you if you teach a move, and I, I not that I don't teach moves, like I like to teach from positions and then explain your overarching like objective, and then like you can show movements from there. But I think there needs to be like a drilling portion where like they practice the movement that they're doing and then some type of positional or semi live training where they're in that position and they're like fulfilling that objective that they're taught to, that they're taught to be looking for, you know, like, so for example, like I think, I think guard retention is a very hard thing to teach because like guard retention itself is not like a move. It's like the idea of like keeping the person in front of you and connected with them like, which is like, can be accomplished in so many different ways. So like, I'll do drills with the students where I say, okay, one person on top is trying to not even pass the guard. But the person on top is trying to step to your hip line. And the person on bottom is just doing anything they can to keep the person on top in front of them. Mm -hmm. So instead of like, this is how you high leg, this is how you elbow escape. You kind of like give them this objective based training, like just keep the person in front of you. Then someone who's never trained before, all of a sudden it kind of looks like they know jiu-jitsu because like they're not thinking about doing moves they're just thinking about what the objective is so okay i definitely like especially for beginners i like teaching like that like this is your object in certain positions like i think there's you have to show people moves but like you know this is what a kimura is like this is you know whatever this is this is how you do a collar show like, there's definitely ways to there's times you have to do that but i think giving them objectives and then kind of letting them work in a semi live way. Definitely. I think increases the skills a little bit faster and it makes them like feel more comfortable and like it more 
Because there's so many times I feel like a beginner will take a class and they learn three moves and they're like, uh, this is like where does this fit into everything that I'm yeah. doing? So like definitely having a set like like curriculum where you're kind of cycling through positions and then giving them objectives from those positions and letting them train in a semi-live way where they can work those objectives, I think is important. Okay. Yeah. And those objectives are like, are, are you just having them build it off some of their like failures or their comp losses? Or are you just building a whole curriculum for the class that everybody no, follows? I would say specifically like for the beginners, I kind of structure it like this, but um, I mean, in the advanced class, like I'll, I don't want to say like, I don't teach it like that, but like most people have a general idea of what they should be doing in these positions that I'll show more movements than like, just like, this is what, you know, this is your overarching goal, but I'll do a lot of positional training. Like every, every class I teach, like we do like usually three positional rounds and then we'll do regular matches after. And that's what at, at Henzo's, that's what data, we, every class we would do three positional rounds. Sometimes in the morning we do uh, like, cause it used to be an 8am session and a noon session. We do five positional rounds in the morning and one match at the end. And then we do three positional rounds in the afternoon and then three matches at the end. Okay. Um, yeah. And so depending on what we're doing, I'll, I'll have, uh, you know, I'll change the position rounds, but it would always be some type of like passing round, some type of like back take back defense round, some type of like pin escape round, and then maybe some type of wrestling round or some type of leg entanglement round. So something where you're going to like cover a lot of, or different position rounds where if you kind of put them all together, you cover the whole range of skills mm -hmm. you need to work on. And then in the open rounds, you obviously can do whatever. But if you just only do open rounds, obviously you might not end up in a lot of these positions. That's true. Okay. And when you like are thinking about your jujitsu career and everything, what would you say was one of your like biggest failures and what did you learn from it? Um, biggest, you know, in, ter in terms of like how – like in terms of like competition or just how yeah like i would I, say in, in terms I've of made. decisions you've made um i would say biggest failures um hmm, maybe like not cross training earlier hmm. like i didn't i like i only trained and like I, I mean i love the gym i train i love sarah's like matt sarah's gym who's like you know, it's like a home to me. Like I spent so many years there, but I like never had went to Unity or Marcelo. It's not that I want to go there necessarily, but like I wish I had cross trained a little bit earlier than I did. Like I didn't really. Not that I never trained other gyms, but like I pretty much only trained at one gym. But I wish I cross trained earlier than than black belt. I think like in my head, I kind of like built a lot of people up to be bet better than they were if that makes sense like if i only trained in my gym i would be like oh i can't beat this person they're trained at this gym or they they're super good and then like like over the years like especially training hands i would like to train with a lot of those people i was like wait like i i'm better than this person you know it kind of like didn't you know i guess like not doing that didn't give me you know i don't want to say i was like kept in my small bubble it was like wasn't a small bubble at all like sarah's a pretty big gym but like i think i i would have liked to be exposed to like more things earlier on in my career in that sense like exposed to training with other cross training okay and i mean we just had that huge case happen with the the gym owner with the guy who came in what, what is your advice as like a as someone who is cross training and cross training etiquette kind of um that's interesting. Uh, was that was that guy cross training, or was he a student there? I, th I think he was cross training, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know much about the the case particulars. But yeah, um, I mean, I guess it depends. I mean, I, I would say generally general cross training etiquette. Like if you go to another gym you've never been to before, um, you know, obviously you want to be respectful. Like probably the general rule is like. You know, you match the pace of your training partners. Like, obviously, don't crack any submissions. Like, don't, you know, you know you're not going there to, to prove yourself. I would say that rule applies to 98% of people. But I would also say if you're, like, a actual serious competitor and, like, you're going to a gym to cross train, I'm not saying you should go crazy and try to hurt anybody. But, like, a lot of times the intent of that is to, 
go to a gym to get different looks and get hard rolls that you might not get at your current gym. So maybe the first a few times there, you kind of pull back a little bit until you get comfortable in the environment. But I mean, looking at Henzo's, for example, like I mean, there's just so many people coming in and out of the place. Like sometimes there'd be 120 <laughs> people on the mat. Like, and there's like, like that was one of the coolest things about it is because there was constant visitors. Like it was like you roll with someone you've never seen before and you know, never met before, don't know what they're going to do. It's almost like a competition mm -hmm. in that sense. And so Jeez. definitely there, it wasn't like, because it, it was such a very different environment there. It wasn't like people were coming in, people were coming to try to like take your head off, which in one sense was good. But I think for the average person visiting the gym across town, you know, I probably would reel back a little bit, like, you know, be on your best behavior. Yeah. The first day. Um, uh, going back to that case, like, I mean, I don't know if that guy was cross training, but I mean, it's uh, it's like kind of interesting because I I definitely, you know, obviously feel for the guy. It's terrible what happened. His whole life is potentially destroyed, and I mean, I feel for the instructor also. You know, yeah, that guy, that instructor. I know he's a, I don't know if he competes anymore, but he was a really good competitor for a while. He was like a few belts ahead of me when I was coming up. He might have been like a brown belt when I was a blue belt, but he, I know he won key worlds. He was a good competitor, and. I mean, I do think he was a little negligent in the way he applied the move, but like, I don't think it was, you know, anything like anything super crazy. I think it was a lot of them had a freak accident. So it's kind yeah. of like just sad to all the parties involved in that situation. I think it sets as a gym owner, it's like a little scary. Yeah. But for me, like just seeing that situation, um, you know, I heard the the waiver that he signed was not admissible in court due to some technical errors. So we actually like hired an attorney to look at our waiver after after like hearing that. But yeah, it's, it's all, all around. I think it's kind of a shitty situation. Do you think Obviously, it'll have an impact on the sport and kind of cross training and people going to other gyms? Um, maybe not cross training. I think it'll have an impact on gym owners and insurance as a he's at least in my experience like insurance for jiu-jitsu gyms is really cheap like it's mm -hmm. really cheap like mu like much cheaper than you would think it would be like from an outsider's perspective like i think it might cause premiums to go up it might set a precedent for any time a student gets hurt at the gym like potentially suing the gym which like uh, i mean like to to me like as someone who practices jiu-jitsu like i guess it's like 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 so they're they're saying he was negligent like in, in the way he applied the move and i think they're like taking the perspective that he's a black belt the other guy's a white belt as if like the black belt isn't capable of like making a mistake like i, I don't think yeah. he was like i think he was trying his best in the role and like you know that's like saying like what if like you're rolling with me and you slip and fall and break my neck like are you negligent like uh, like it's not even that like it's like it's it's a, like um you're like doing a sport where like you're trying to things hurt things are happening yeah. real time and like you're, you're not like trying i did you definitely didn't try to hurt the person no like you're not like in the moment like oh this might injure the person i'm going to do it anyway like i don't even think that thought crossed his mind and and you're like you're like fighting or resisting opponent whether they're a white belt or not you know I don't, I don't know. It, it seems like, like it, it seems like it sets a pre precedent that like anybody could be held liable for injuring someone in a role. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And and like a, as a gym owner too, it, it must kind of set a precedent for you to even just watch your other students rolling with people, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it definitely uh, kind of freaks me out a little bit, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, it makes me like want to not like, we don't really let beginners roll right away anyway, but like, makes me like, you know, should I make the brand new guys wait even longer to train? Like, God forbid something happens. You know, it's definitely a little freaky to think about. Yeah. And, and what are some of the like negatives and positives of being a gym owner versus just being a student? Um, I would say, I mean, I, I definitely feel that there's a lot of positives, uh, for myself but i will say and I, like even though i i've you know i opened this gym 
almost eight months ago now, but I've always worked at the gym I trained at for the for the most part. Like so, I worked at Sarah's. I was like full time instructor there for years. So I've like I've always had the relate at least recently relationship with the gym where it's like my job at the same time. So I do kind of that's one thing I kind of liked about going to Henzo's. Even aside from everything else, it was great. It was just like you go in there. And like I had no responsibility. Just, I'm just there to train, you know. Yeah. So pretty much, that's never the case for me, you know. And it hasn't been for a while. <laughs> like, you know, it's it's my job as well as like my hobby, whatever, my passion, whatever. So like, there's always like that kind of added element to it. Mm-hmm. So I definitely do miss just like showing up to the gym, training and moving, and not caring about anything else. But at the same time. Um, like being my own boss, owning my own gym, having my own students is, you know, it's definitely one of the most rewarding things I've done in my life so far. And I'm very happy with uh, the way things are going. I'm very happy that I made the decision to do this. But yeah, that is th- definitely one thing that I miss about just being a student. The more relaxed vibe of yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and are you noticing like, with the growth of jiu-jitsu, you're getting a lot more people kind of coming in looking to have that pro career, or, or is it still just a, a um, the hobbyist generally? I definitely do have I, – I definitely have a pretty good group of guys who are pretty serious about training. Um, I would say like I have uh, – I have a few people at the gym that I would consider like pro-level competitors. Um, but, yeah, there's definitely uh, – especially some of the, like, the younger, newer guys – like are a little more serious and looking to, you know, do this from like a full-time perspective, it, you know, assuming they're able to, I mean, most of them are blue and purple belts. They, you know, either in school or they have jobs and are trying to figure out how to make a career doing this, which is definitely a difficult thing to do. But I think there's definitely more people now that are trying to do that, especially because they've seen the success of like people already doing it. So it kind of paves, paves the pathway for that to happen versus when I started, like there's like nobody who did this as yeah. a career. You know, either you fought MMA or you opened a gym, which for me, I kind of always wanted to open a gym anyway, so kind of fit. But the, you know, there's nobody making money competing in jiu-jitsu. It's like it was not a thing at all. Yeah, how did you get through those years where you're just like, how how do I pay for anything as a competitor? Were you just working two uh, jobs? Well, I, I always taught, so that, like I was kind of in a unique situation because I taught for Matt and Matt always had a pretty big gym Mm -hmm. i taught a lot of private lessons okay uh so i was like kind of the head instructor of the gym and and i I just did like i I was teaching like 15 or 20 privates a week at one point so like i pretty much like like made pretty good money doing that for a while uh like now i don't i still teach some like i kind of like tapered off a lot because i don't i don't want to do it anymore because i did it for so long i have the gym i need to do it but for a while i basically did it off of teaching privates, which I think for a lot of jiu-jitsu guys, it's, it's not, not, I don't want to say not feasible, but they're probably not in a situation where they can do it. Cause I was like, I was basically the main instructor at like an already big gym. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there wasn't like a ton of, I mean, there's, a, there's like some MMA fighters, but there wasn't a ton of like competitors there. I was like, I was like, if you wanted to take private lessons, like Matt didn't teach privates. Like I was the guy to go to. And there was, you know, a bunch of guys there with like disposable income. You know, Matt's gym probably had 500 students. So there's like a lot of people interested in teaching lessons, a lot of people interested in doing lessons. So I was like kind of the person you would go to, especially at the time when I was there. And it's just like, at first, like, you know, it was like when I first like started doing it, I had a couple of people and then it just kind of blew up. Then I taught people online for a while. Like I like was doing like a ton of private. So that's basically how I, I how I lived. Huh. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, a number of years, yeah. And and uh, with the teaching online, w- one thing I've kind of noticed about your instructionals is they're a lot easier to digest than like the Gordon ones or something, or the John. They're, even the John ones are kind of they're slow, but yours tend to have like a lot of information, really easy to digest. Everything's understandable. What do you think? Do you think teaching so many privates has just allowed you to learn how to kind of speak to people? Are you looking to have just a little bit more fun at jujitsu? 
and are over the age of 21, well, today's sponsors got you covered, Owl's Oil. What they are is a dispensary grade based hemp product and they come in gummies. These are the vegan options. We also have a regular option, a high dose option, they're 40 tons collab and if you buy this actually the profits are going to restorative justice and getting people out of jail who have committed cannabis crimes then they also sell their blunts i'll pull that out just a blunt it's also wrapped in this coconut paper and that is delicious and if you just want to hit it on the go they have their cartridges now these are coil cartridges that are made with ceramic coils so they're going to be able to burn at lower temperatures and everything here is also American made. These containers I have right here, this is reclaimed ocean plastic. So now you are giving back when you buy any of their 40 tons products and you're doing something good for the environment. If you see here, there's kind of a little scratcher. And what that does is that's your verify. It's gonna give you all of their test results. You're gonna be able to make sure that this has never been opened before. So that's something really cool. They're using the blockchain for that. The vegan ones are gonna have a tiny bit of sugar, but it's not bad, it's all organic. These are very healthy ingredients. And yeah, I just love the products. I love to use them before class, after class for recovery. And if you use code 420 on their website right now, you're gonna get 40% off all of their products. That goes until 420, so enjoy. Yeah, I will say, I definitely think that's a skill I, I think I'm pretty good at because I've taught so many privates and so many classes. I mean, I've been teaching. I mean, even, I mean, Danaher, for example, has definitely taught probably more classes in privates than I have. But so, someone like Gordon, I mean, he's taught classes, but he spent most of his time as a student. Mm -hmm. like, I'm not saying he never taught classes, but like I spent a ton of time. Like I would never take a class at Sarah's because like, I was teaching all the classes. So I spent so much time as uh, uh, as an instructor and, and teaching lessons as well. Uh, I just always felt comfortable, like, you know, just getting the point across. Like, and I, and I feel like I know what I'm talking about. So this is this position, you do this, this, and this, and that, that's, the, that's the move. Like you know, there doesn't need to be, you know, anything else in, in there. Okay. And are, are you having any instructionals planned soon to come out? I'm actually filming one this weekend. Um, on Saturday, so I have, I, have, I have three with fanatics right now, and so mm -hmm. this, will, this will be my fourth one. Okay, S sweet. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, what, what does BJJ really mean to you, and like, how do you stay going in it and motivated? I'm sorry, say it again. What does BJJ mean to you, and like, how are you staying motivated to keep going in it? Um, for me, it's um, it's like a constant. What, what I like most about it is it it's like a constant like problem solving activity like where i'm training and it's to me it's always there's always something to work on there's always something new that i could be practicing and my like favorite thing is when i like am doing a position and i come up with a new variation of something and like work on that and apply that and kind of fit it into the rest of my game to me it's like a it's just like a constant puzzle to solve. That's what that's what I like most about it. And actually, um, and I, I think many people who are like fairly experienced in it, in, in jujitsu, like kind of feel this way that it gets kind of stale where they're doing the same things, they're doing the same moves all the time. And I think that's where people kind of lose interest. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just because like I have a lot of competitors in my gym where I'm always, you know, watching matches or watching tape, like trying to figure stuff out. For me, it's like just a, continuous like revolving door of like coming up with a solution to a problem and then a new problem arises like coming up, or trying to come up with a solution to that problem and to me it's like it, it always stays very like feels new and relevant and invigorating okay so you're just keeping new stuff coming in yeah okay I mean, that's one of my favorite things is to try like new variations to positions i'm already doing and try to come up with different ways or better ways like if I if I do something a certain way and I feel like I come up with a better way to do that, I like discard the old way and then use the new way. Is that? And to me, that's like one of the most enjoyable things to do. Okay, and and um, you know, just just want you to kind of let everybody know like what's in the future this year and then into ADCC. Like, what what are you looking at? 
So uh, big goal for this year is the trials for this year and potentially next year, depending how the first trials go. Uh, I mean, I, I plan to qualify for ADCC for 2024. So that's, that's my main focus right now. I'm doing the ADCC open in two weeks in Canada. So uh, like the last trial that took second, uh, like not last trials, but like, like the last cycle before that. Um, and, you know, I think I could have won in this last trial that I've lost in the quarterfinals, but I was the two seed and I definitely think I should have won the tournament. So. I'm like definitely, I'm definitely, you know, going out there to win, and I think I have a good chance to win. Hell yeah! Are you gonna or do pans or worlds? Uh, I don't. When is Nogi pans? I, I probably will do that. I know the trials are like, I think they're October like 14th. I don't know if the dates coincide. One of them is like December 9th. <laughs> I just know that. Oh really? Maybe that's Nogi worlds. Maybe I'll yeah. do that then. Okay, um, so we'll see you there, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So, I know, are you going to be at 88, 99 minus or? Uh, I'm going to, so this, this, um, this one in two weeks, it's, the, the, it's weird because the opens do different weight classes than actual ADCC, which is yeah. sense. So this one is 83 kilograms. There's like 182. So like I did 88, uh, last time. Um, I mean, like, this is like not, it's like in between. It's basically halfway between. 77 to 88 so like maybe i'll do 77 i guess i'll see how like this goes getting down for that but um it'll be set probably 88 but 77 as well. okay that'll be sick and uh yeah i mean if you just want to tell anybody anything that you're uh you're wanting people to know uh just go for it before we kind of close out here yeah uh you guys check out my instagram jason rao bjj89 post reels pretty much every day technique reels if you guys are, you know, if you guys like that, I have a Patreon. Um, Twenty five dollars a month. I have, you know, at this point, probably one hundred and fifty technique videos posted on there. So it's pretty good uh, database of, of videos. It's just twenty five bucks a month. You have access to all that. I also have three instructionals on BJJ Fanatics. If you guys are interested, you can also check out my gym page, Vanguard Academy JJ. Uh, if you're ever in New York, come down. Please come train with us. Hell yeah. Well, thank you, Jason. I uh, yeah. appreciate you for coming on. That was sick and it was awesome <laughs> to talk to you. Thank you, Gabe. I appreciate you having me.